PM board bombs. Now, here's doctors Iltafat Hussein and Blake Briggs. Welcome back <laughs> to EM Board Bombs, where we're doing another video podcast episode. I don't know how I feel about this, I'll be honest with you still. I know I said that last time, Briggs. Mm -hmm. I, I heard you, but uh, it's great to see your lovely face, and I'm just happy to be here. Yeah, uh, I am as well. I don't even know how that first video turned out, because I'm not on all the socials, mm -hmm. so... Mm -hmm. How how did it turn out? Uh, Elon pretty... actually retweeted it. He was pretty impressed. Did he? Mm -hmm. oh, okay, interesting. Uh, he said Marlena this is the next me... big thing. Oh, the next. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I don't really. I don't know if we wanted his endorsement after what's going on with Twitter. So <laughs> don't know about that. Sorry, we um, can uh, just join Threads now on Meta. Have you heard about that? Yeah. Hey, you want me to tell you a funny story? Before Please. I forget. Hey, before so, you tell your funny story, um, yeah. this is Ian Board Bombs, and oh, we yes. are the multi-platform edutainment we teach, tell you what you need to know for boards as well as hashtag em live both of which are important but em life is more important obviously so. yeah. but we tell you what you need to know nothing more nothing less blue collar yeah and our motto is come for the stems stay for the content 10 right. to 15 minute episodes sometimes a little bit longer due to banter but banter is important it is. It is. You know, we've gotten yeah. feedback before mm -hmm. where um, there's one person in particular that reached out to us and wrote us about a paragraph long saying they did not enjoy our banter, mm -hmm. to which we responded and said, there are probably a lot of other podcasts out there for you. Yeah. And uh, we're not, there's a lot of boring we're podcasts out there. Wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're fantastic. We got us wrong. This is not us. Yeah. They're just, they're just boring, though. Hey, tell me your story. And we got to dive into this topic. Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, I, you know, I went, I went jogging today and we were having mm -hmm. a conversation earlier today and I told you, yes, you know, I'm going to go run a marathon. I, first of all, I didn't realize that a marathon was like 26 miles. I thought it yeah, was 26.2. Like, I thought it was like 23. No. Uh, anyways, um, I traveled yesterday, maybe not hydrated as, as best as I could. And I mm -hmm. thought I'm just going to go for like a super long, long jog. Yeah, I've done like kind of long jogs before. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it was like in the nineties. I don't know why I didn't realize that. So, yeah. you know, I had my whole jogging gear with my water bottles that were like one of those vests and Ooh, all that stuff. yeah i'm you not know, surprised fancy stuff i i know mm. and you know i'm chugging along doing okay it's like 90 some degrees 95 degrees doing all right and uh i make it to mile marker nine we so had tobacco road to, yeah i was on tobacco road mm. yeah great place exactly. a great place uh, you've been there uh, you mm. and i have both uh mm. traveled the trail together when mm. uh you've come and visited mm. and um you know, at mile nine, I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do like a full 26 miles. Right. Uh, so I turned around at mile marker and I went, you know, I'll get like 19, 20 miles in. Not a big deal. So I'm coming back three miles away from my destination home. And all of a sudden, my legs start cramping. Oh, no. It's terrible. <laughs> oh, no. So I started just like, I've never had to do this before ever. I mean, I've done some long jogs before, but I had to phone a friend. So one of my buddies lives close by. It was by. called uh, Air Flight, Air Care. Yeah. I was just like, uh, I'm going to need you to come pick me up because I literally cannot move my right calf. <laughs> it was the first time in my life where I've actually mm. had true cramps and it, my calf was just in a flexed position. <laughs> oh, so boy. And then you... But it's funny because I thought about you, uh, mm -hmm. Briggs, and I blame oh, you completely. Boy. Thank I you. blame you completely mm -hmm. because you told me before this, you were like, yeah, I don't know how that's going to go for you. And uh, <laughs> you also implied that uh, I might need some help, you know, at some point during the jog. So, I was doing it in a friendly manner because we're colleagues and friends. Yeah. I, I, anyways, I just want to let you know it's your fault. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. I accept the blame. And um, <laughs> there's a reason that I had um, SAR, search and rescue on call, ready to go over at Tobacco You did Road. tell me that before I mm -hmm. went. Before yes. I want you to tell me that. Hey, uh, let's jump into the stem. We should. Yeah. Why don't you read that stem? Sure. A 10 day old female. Oh boy. Neonate. I'm signing off. Okay. We're done. I know. Can you, that's like that on the Epic screen or whatever, you know, where you see like the age show up and like yeah. the red dot pop yeah. up and it's, it says 10. You're like, Oh, is that 10 year? Yeah. Oh, yeah. it's yeah. day. Don't they know there's a children's hospital in town? <laughs> right. Right. That's what the nurses always say. That's what the nurses all <laughs> <laughs> oh that's great like, <laughs> like what do we they know where they're gonna go <laughs> yeah exactly like we should just tell them to leave i'm like well that would be against federal law but <laughs> and maybe we can help <laughs> <laughs> yes, <I know. laughs> 
All right. Uh, a 10 day old female neonate oh, man. is brought to your ED by mom because she noticed that she felt warm. She was born via spontaneous vaginal delivery, born at 38 weeks gestation. When you ask mother about birth history, she states everything was normal about the delivery. You notice no notes from the OB team. When you ask mother about this, she states delivery happened at an, quote, alternative birthing center. <laughs> Where she really loved the ambiance and the Spotify playlist that they were playing. Hey, that's mm. important. That's important. Mm -hmm. She's wondering if her child feels warm from what she describes as an excessive use of incense that the birthing center had while she was delivering. You proceed to ask, was it sandalwood? Is that is that a particular mm. type of incense? It is. Or lavender. I'm pretty sure they didn't have the incense that we burn in Indian homes, though. Mm. I can tell you that. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Here I'm sure it was the, bought at Whole, Whole Foods. But there you go. There you go. That 100%. Maybe even Trader Joe's. Ah, no, actually, you're right. Whole Foods. Here in the ED, child is febrile, but well appearing with no other signs of infection. Which of the following is the next best step? Hmm. Is it A, blood work, urinalysis, and lumbar puncture with admission? Is it B, blood work, urinalysis, and admission? C, blood work, urinalysis, and if it's normal, discharge? Or D, no blood work and discharge home with next day pediatrician follow-up. And choice E, call pediatrician and transfer. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. That's, that's not, not the answer choice. Yeah, that's not the answer choice. Briggs, what's the correct answer? Hey, I'm going to tell you the correct answer, but... Uh, one, welcome to any new interns, people that are starting Ooh. off in July. Yeah. No, seriously, welcome to the podcast if you're listening. If yeah. this is your first episode in July, we hope you're not starting the pediatric ED. <laughs> oh, Imagine man. this is like your first patient. You know. walk in, you're like, I think they can just follow up tomorrow. <laughs> right. And you know it's going to be some intern's first patient because uh, that senior who's sniping at this point is going like, to avoid this. Yeah, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let that new yeah. intern pick up the ten day. <laughs> I know when I was a senior, I was just picking up ortho all day long because that was the easiest. <laughs> churn and burn. <laughs> yeah, churn and burn. Let me get an X ray. I'll see him in a few minutes. Anyway, right. <laughs> hey, correct answer here is choice A: blood work, urine analysis, and lumbar puncture with admission. Right. We're doing max effort here. Hey, hmm. before we dive into this difficult topic, uh, let's talk about EM Rapid Bombs. EM Rapid Bombs is our premium podcast and. It is an awesome resource, the only one of its kind in emergency medicine and in medicine in general. I haven't seen anybody, any other fields do this, which is two to four minute episodes. We drop multiple episodes a week. You get your own private RSS feed when you subscribe. So you not only get access to all of our study guides and these podcasts you're listening to now, but you get this special podcast that tells you coaching, how the test is going to ask you these questions, what you need to know for real life, and all the answer choices, why they're wrong, what's right how the test is going to frame that question and what you need to know. We have over 365 episodes now, so right. you literally have an episode for every day of the year. And there's more coming every single week the sooner you sign up. We also offer uh, residency discounts and bulk discounts as well. So feel free to look into that and let us know what you think. Yeah, it's been really cool to see some residencies have signed up. And then mm -hmm. also what we're seeing a lot of is folks within the residency will just get together and yeah. just go for that bulk discount. So yeah. it's a great way to We call keep it the grassroots bulk. I don't even know what that means, right? Grassroots. Grassroots movements? You don't know that? Yeah, yeah. No, okay. Okay, oh, anyway. okay, okay, I got yeah, you. I okay. Got you. Yeah, okay. I was going to say, come on, you're American. Everything's <laughs> grassroots. All right. So, <laughs> so there have been some recent guideline changes to working up neonates. Neonates, yep. of course, being less than or equal to 28 days old with a fever. So instead of rehashing new changes, let's just start from scratch, go through neonatal fever in a blitz here and tell you what you need to know. So first of all, what's a fever? <laughs> I love it. You know exactly what I'm going to say. You know exactly what I'm going to say, I know, don't you? I know, I know. A fever is not 99. Yeah. A fever is not 99.9. Yeah. A fever in the medical literature is 100.4, greater or equal to 100.4 Fahrenheit. And if you're in Canada, it's greater or equal to 38 Celsius. Yeah, yeah. Overall, viruses remain the obvious, most common cause of fever in everyone, especially neonates. However, right. even if neonates have a viral infection, they can still have a serious or invasive bacterial infection. 
and compared to older infants, neonates are increased risk of mortality from viruses too. So who carries the highest risk here, Iltfat? So this you know, cohort is going to be that neonates less than or equal to 21 days old. Mm -hmm. You have to remember though, prematurity, we have to take that into account, right? Mm -hmm. So premature infants, they have rates of sepsis 10 to 12 times that of term infants. And so if you have a pre, you know, like a preemie that's showing up, you have to also remember that 21 day old, you know, cohort that we're giving you, you need to extend that out, you know, appropriately mm -hmm. for, for, you know, taking into account that prematurity. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to key risk factors, what you're looking for, for that patient, you know, again, who's at highest risk, ill appearing, right? So if the child is lethargic, irritable, respiratory distress, all those things are not good. Um, <laughs> they're just not, you know, especially again on that sub, you know, 30 day old group, right? Mm -hmm. Chronically ill infants, it's kind of hard to be a chronically ill infant when you're just born, but unfortunately, you know, some of these kiddos when they're born, they've already had you know, some sort of medical procedure done, some sort of surgical management mm -hmm. done. Mm -hmm. So obviously those infants, you need to really, or really those neonates, you need to really, really be aggressive about working up. Right. Uh, lastly, you know, some of the maternal factors I think are important to discuss as well. So any maternal fever, that's why asking mother for that birth history is so, right. so critical, right? key questions you can ask her, hey, were, did you require IV antibiotics at any point? Were you having any fevers during the delivery process? Mm -hmm. So any history of, you know, maternal fever, uh, any, you know, history of group B strep, you know, that's another big one that you're right. always asking, right? So GBS, positive or negative, uh, that's something that OB knows all about. And yeah. if the mother had chorioamnioitis, then Yes, that's another risk factor. So really any infections that the mother had. Now, when it comes to actual infection sources, I'm going to let you take care of that one, Briggs. This is our first obvious board question of the day here. Yep. UTIs are the most common site of bacterial infections in neonates. Say that you again. Say that louder. Louder for the back? Louder for the back? Yep, louder, please. UTIs, you can see me do it now. On the podcast, yeah. you never used to see <laughs> UTIs make up the most common site of bacterial infections in neonates. Boom. So E. coli is obviously still the king, always, mm. and is the most common bacterial pathogen to cause UTIs and bacteremia, as well as bacterial meningitis. Right. So it's the winner of all three. It's a triple crown of bacteria mm. in neonates. Oh, yeah. And GBS is actually the second group E strep. Right. So unfortunately, diving here into the history and physical, your history is going to be quite short. It's a neonate. <laughs> Yeah, really so sadly, much. febrile neonates do not commonly demonstrate anything that hint to an underlying bacterial infection. Even worse, almost half of neonates present with sepsis may have a normal temperature or they're hypothermic. And you're just going yeah. off the mother's history, which, by the way, studies show you can definitely trust. Yeah. Mothers uh, know. Absolutely, they know. mothers know. You got to trust them. Absolutely. When they tell you they have a fever at home and they come into the ED with no fever, you need to take that. Yeah, completely even, even, at face value. Right, and even a mother who is saying something's not right, you know, yes, that's 100%. a huge red flag. Trust Absolutely, them all. 100%. Those presenting very sick need resuscitation, and that is beyond the scope of this particular podcast. In fact, right. we talk about sick neonates in the rapid bombs, so check it out, and you get that several. special degree, several episodes of talking about really sick, scary neonates. Yeah, and rapid bombs. Frightening, but we'll That's right. That's Yamrapidbombs.supercast.com, right. baby. There are multiple episodes there on the neonates yeah. because they scare everyone. They do, including us. So let's focus on the well-appearing neonates with fever because that's the most common group here. So the critical questions asked the caregiver is, how has the feeding been? How has the neonate been in terms of increased crying or weak cry? And then, of course, asking about the perinatal history and delivery that Iltifat already yeah, covered, asking about gestational about. age, asking about complications with the mother, et cetera. Yeah. Now, the neonatal exam is going to rely heavily on physician experience and knowledge. It's not easy for a beginner. And mm -hmm. if you're an intern, go easy on yourself. This is difficult. Right. You're going to do a full you know, auscultation listening for pneumonia. Look for umphalitis from the umbilical stump. Look for cutaneous cellulitis. You know, fully expose the neonate here. Take off the right. diaper. Look everywhere. Meningitis is super rare to find on exam. This whole nuchal rigidity, I always laugh when people tell me about nuchal yeah. rigidity. They had no nuchal rigidity. I'm like, well, that's a joke. The original study from nuclear rigidity, I don't know if you knew this, came from, you're going to love this. Have you heard this? Do you know where the no, study came from? No, the original nuclear point. rigidity like study, like when it hit like textbooks, was 1900s in 
babies that had tuberculosis meningitis before mm. the antibiotic era. Mm. <laughs> Man, and that has carried on for decades and decades. Yeah, exactly. It's like the lidocaine digit thing, you know? Mm. Anyway, more reliable clues are going to be, you know, inconsolability, any seizures, obviously, bulging fontanelle or changes in tone. It's fontanelle if you're American, but fontanelle if you're Italian, by the way. I don't know if you knew that. Um, <laughs> About 50% Italian, too. I don't know if you knew that either. So, um, uh, that explains the Catholic thing. Okay. <laughs> that, that was um, quite aggressive labeling, but okay. <laughs> anyway, all febrile neonates with a local infection. This is also another board question here. All febrile neonates with a focal infection like cellulitis, abscess, mastitis, pneumonia, septic arthritis, whatever, they still have to get the complete sepsis workup. You still have to do everything. Even neonates with a viral infection require the full sepsis workup because the rates of bacterial infections do not differ from neonates without viral infections. Yeah, and, and it's, I remember in this case, having this case with one of my favorite peds attending when I was a resident. I was like, oh, awesome. We found the UTI. We're done. We're done, right? And they're like, yeah, right. Nobody. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> nope. They're like, get that LP tray ready. Yeah, exactly. Get ready to get your LP numbers up. That's where I got mine from, and kids. Yeah. Hey, so tell us about 8 to 21 day olds here. Yeah, so 8 to 21 days old, full evaluation for sepsis, you're going to be doing that. We will say there's been some shifts in mm -hmm. certain hospitals in terms of what their protocols are. So mm -hmm. you really should find out what your pediatricians and ID team, PEDS ID team, mm -hmm. and your ER team has kind of come up with, right? Right. But there's going to be some sort of amalgamation of the following. Right. CBC, CMP, you're getting the blood cultures, urinalysis, urine culture, COVID-19 test and influenza, maybe even getting an RVP, so a respiratory viral panel, mm -hmm. chest x-ray, and then plus or minus like pro you know, procalcitonin or CRP. Lastly, the big one, the LP, the LP. Right? So the CSF, you know, cell count, culture, protein, glucose, gram stain. HSV studies should be obtained in high-risk neonates. So, you know, and this is where the history comes in, right? So maternal mm -hmm. history of general lesions, maternal fevers from 48 hours before to after delivery, or, you know, neonatal vesicle seizures, hypothermia, oral ulcers. Elevated scary stuff. Yeah, just scary stuff there. Yeah. <laughs> hey, break it down for the 22 to 28 day olds. Exactly. So 22, 28 day old, this is what's changed recently. And this yeah. is big news. Now, are the right. boards going to cover this? No. Nope. But in real life, I think this is really good for real life because we are doing so many unnecessary yes. LPs on this population. Yeah. So this is game changing. And if you're an adult physician or, you know, seeing kids still as a, a pediatric emergency doctor, you definitely should be incorporating this in your practice. It's mainstream. So 22 to 28 days old, only neonates with risk factors for serious bacterial infection need the full workup, what we just talked about. Mm -hmm. Now, traditionally, this group was included in that full sepsis workup. Um, all of us that are listening to this podcast that have been out oh, at yeah. least like a couple of years, this was still that the thing. less than 30 days, right? You were exactly. automatically any kiddo less yep. than 30 days. Didn't matter. But recent evidence has found that the 22 to 28 day old group has a lower risk when inflammatory markers and urine studies are normal. And they can be managed without an LP, which is mm. such a game changer here. And this is called the quote stepwise evaluation. Now, the CSF studies have to be obtained. Thank you for the air quotes. I appreciate that. Mm. CSF studies should be obtained if one or more are abnormal. And Again, I want to emphasize that we have a handout on this. We're not telling you this to memorize all this stuff. This is all on an algorithm. It's on up to date. It's on different uh, EM yeah, websites. Yeah, and your hospital is going to have exactly, your own and you're never going to well, be right? tested on this on yeah. the boards. This is right. just good for real life. So again, the CSF studies should be obtained if one or more abnormal: procalcitonin, CRP, absolute neutrophil count greater than four thousand, or rectal temp greater than thirty-eight point five Celsius or one hundred one point three Fahrenheit. If there are no abnormal findings of those. The evidence has been found that the risk of invasive bacterial infection is less than 0.7%. Mm. Wow. So you observe these patients in the hospital until the blood cultures are normal and you're done. Yeah, and that's the key thing. You're, you're still admitting them, right? Yes. Uh, and you're still observing them. Um, you don't still have to put them to the LP, doing a lot of testing, great. but it's really just not doing the LP yeah. process on this. And again, remember, your hospital is going to have mm -hmm. their own protocols, but this yeah. is part of that, quote, stepwise evaluation. And if your hospital doesn't admit kids, obviously you're transferring. But this right. is something you'd have to don't you don't have to worry about doing the LP, of course. So, right. All right. So, why don't you take us through the uh, antibiotics, uh, what we're giving, and then we'll end the podcast here. This is very automatic. Again, as you said, protocol based. 
the antibodies are going to be listed in the protocols at your hospital normally. They're ready to go. But right. you do have to know, unfortunately, the antibodies for the test. This is something the test will ask you on is like what mix of antibiotics you're going to give a neonate right. that has a fever. Right. So again, your link would be asked kind of that 8 to 21 day old. Uh, they're going to require just empiric antibiotic therapy, right? And admission to the yeah. hospital. Yeah. So if there's no obvious source of infection identified, the following agents are going to be the ones that are preferred. Ampicillin plus one of the following. So again, remember ampicillin is the key one, plus one of the following. Ceftazidime, cefepime, cefotaxime, or gentamicin. You can forget gentamicin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not... Right. You're, you're likely going to be doing like, you know, yes. like cephalosporin. cephalosporin. Yeah, cephalosporin. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Acyclovir, if at high risk for HSV, as we discussed before, mm -hmm. um, right. but a lot of hospitals um, and frankly, a lot of peds ID folks, pretty aggressive with acyclovir. Mm -hmm. And then vancomycin is the last one to remember. That's usually reserved for critically ill or for those with some particular, you know, specific and obvious cellulitis or umphalitis. Right. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. Exactly. But that's kind of like that cocktail to remember. Um, I think you, just, you need to remember that ampicillin plus the cephalosporins we talked about, then acyclovir and then vancomycin. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about 22 to 28 day old management. Um, and again, it depends on that stepwise approach, quote, stepwise mm -hmm. that we talked about. Get into that, Briggs. Yeah. So we're not going to go into the details of this. It's in our handout. I don't mm -hmm. want to get in the nitty gritty here because you won't be tested this on the boards. But right. in general, a 22 to 28 day old management depends on the stepwise approach. If the criteria for LP are not met and there's a low suspicion for meningitis, like we said earlier, you're going to admit this patient to the hospital for observation with no antibiotics. Mm, and you're just going to huge. follow up the culture, which is right. fantastic. Again, you're not just wasting antibiotics either. Um, and there, you know, there's harm from antibiotics too, and there's things to consider here. So right. anyway, you're not doing anything. You're just admitting that patient following the blood culture. And then of course, if the LP, if you do have to perform the LP and it shows specific indications or suggestive infection, you're going to give the whole, you know, kit and caboodle of IV antibiotics, right. uh, and admit that patient. It's like we just said, the same antibiotics mm -hmm. we talked about. And if the LP is negative and everything else looks fine, then you're going to discuss observation at home or in the hospital. Now for home observation, that's something that you really got to probably not do. This is just yes. um, classic um, Ivy League nonsense, uh, ivory tower nonsense on up to date that somehow people have really good resources and that's not the patients Ultifa and I take care of. So we would admit these people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're, I mean, you're, you're, you're admitting these folks. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. But that, you will never be tested on that either. So none yeah. of the stuff you have to worry about here except for just knowing the 22, 28 day old patients are a stepwise approach. You can look that up in your practice, but right now, on the boards, you will only be tested on the 8 to 21 day olds, and you're doing the automatic, what we call uh, response, full workup, antibiotics, admit, and that is it for this. If you hear fireworks in the background, I apologize. Hey, 4th of July, and we're still is, recording yeah. a podcast. I mean, that's the we dedication are. that we do, yeah. right? <laughs> this is an American holiday, federal holiday. Everyone is off work today, including the president, yeah. and we are recording a podcast. There you go. Mm -hmm. That's how we do it. We give the people yeah. what they want. And we do. America, baby. <laughs> Shout out to our Canadian listeners. Hey, so that wraps it up. Um, thanks for uh, the patience everyone's had so far while we mm -hmm. figure out this whole video thing. Still yeah. trying to figure it out. Uh, still trying mm -hmm. to figure out, you know, kinks and things that we can use to make this better. So if anyone has any particular feedback, certainly shoot it our way. Um, we'll do our best to listen. If it's uh, criticizing anything that we do, we probably won't listen to you. Um, but if it's uh, mainly just send in feedback, that's like really positive. Yeah. Uh, we only listen to positive uh, feedback. That's pretty much it. Yeah. We don't really, you know, anything negative, we just kind of, mm -hmm. just kind of goes into a bucket that we don't really look at. You know? Speaking of which, drop a five-star app overview, please. We would appreciate that. Yeah. We need to get to a thousand reviews, you know, come mm -hmm. on. Like when is that going to happen? Mm -hmm. I think the, the thing is a lot of folks use Spotify. We do know that mm -hmm. from some of the numbers. Nothing wrong with that. You live hey, your life. You know, we're really excited. July is here. It's one of my favorite times of the month, especially the first mm -hmm. week. I'm super pumped to work with all my new interns. Um, it's a really fun time for interns to come in and learn. Um, so definitely, you know, recommend this podcast to any new interns that are coming on. EMRapidBombs.Supercast.com. That's where you can find our premium feed, where we have over 350 episodes. They're going to be up to 400 soon. And again, that's that two to four minute episodes where we drop just high yield board knowledge. The other thing that Briggs didn't mention is we also give spaced repetition learning. So we've got emails that go out pretty much three times a week. So every few days, you're going to be getting an email in your inbox, giving you high yield board content, board knowledge. 
Mm-hmm. It's another thing to sign up for. Um, and that's pretty much it, Briggs. We really appreciate everyone uh, listening and uh, supporting the pod. Thanks for joining us. See you next time. Peace. Peace.